Hello everyone, my name is Tom Sussman, and welcome to the Primary Stages Virtual Masterclass Series. I'm an actor, and I've appeared at Primary Stages in Discord, the Gospel According to Thomas Jefferson, Charles Dickens, and Leo Tolstoy by Scott Carter. I'm, I think, a well-known face in the New York theater scene. My last appearance was in the abbreviated run of Michael Friedman and Danny Goldstein's Unknown Soldier at Playwrights Horizons. Uh, but I've appeared in many stages here in town, uh, off-Broadway and on, and uh, I think I'm what they call a familiar face on TV, usually playing a lawyer or a doctor, something like that. We are going through some crazy times right now, as you know. Um, and one of the things that I've had to give up is touching my face, which is probably a really, really bad habit that I developed as a young boy and have maintained for many, many decades now. So um, what do I do about not touching my face? Or what, what do I do to keep myself from touching my face right now? It's hard. It, it's, a, it's a constant process. Um, I am, after uh, several weeks of my wife slapping my hand away from my face, I'm finally slapping my own hand away from my face, figuratively speaking. Um, I'm a little bit more conscious of what my hands are doing around my face. That's the only thing I can really, really say. I think in many respects I am uh, the luckiest actor in the world, not because I've I had the good opportunity to work so much uh, in the city where I live, but uh, I'm married to someone in management. Uh, my wife, Penny Dalton, is a company manager, if you will, a legendary company manager, and um, she keeps me honest. Um, show business is two words, show and business. And in our family, I get to do the show, she gets to do the business. It works out great. Um, yeah, she makes all of our travel plans. I think like a lot of actors, um, when I was a young boy, I would um, always play make-believe, and it was a habit that was really, really hard to break. Um, I was play-acting. Uh, I was a little bit of crazy in me. Um, but I gave that up as a young man. When I went to college, um, I gave up uh, any youthful dreams I had of being a performer. And uh, I majored in modern European intellectual history. Uh, the people I admired most were not actors, they were actually historians, and that's something I wanted to be. Um, so I, was, uh, I got my degree in uh, European intellectual history and uh, started a PhD program. In graduate school, my first year I was really, really unhappy in academics. I wasn't suited for it at all. Um, it, it didn't strike me as as um, collaborative in, in in to my way of thinking. I continued to uh, go to the theater a lot. I loved plays. I loved musicals. And uh, one day I saw the national tour of the original production of musical called Pacific Overtures by Stephen Sondheim and John Wiseman, directed by Hal Prince. And the play began, and the stage was filled with people who looked like me. And I had never seen anything like that on the stage before. In addition to which, I had never seen anything so stylistically daring. Um, actually, it wasn't just the style, it was the content, it was the form, everything about it seemed to point at me. It was about history, it was about a clash of cultures, it was about a change in time and space. Something magical happened that day to me. Um, I knew my time in graduate school studying history uh, would soon come to an end from that very night. And uh, a few years later, I stepped off into the crazy world of the performing arts. Uh, I realized that I really did want to be an actor. I realized that it was something that I had wanted to be from the time I was a very small child. I just didn't know how to go about doing it. Um, 
but I went up and I did it. There were a lot of missteps, a lot of learning on my feet. Um, I left Southern California, I moved to New York, and uh, miracle of miracles, I've been working ever since. My Pacific Overtures journey came full circle just a couple seasons ago. Um, I was in the revival of Pacific Overtures, a classic stage company directed by John Doyle. And um, I was a little shocked that, um, that I got the offer to do that because it seemed so, um, it seemed to be a little bit too fairy tale perfect. But it happened. Um, not only did I get to work on the show that made me to be an, made me want to be an actor, the show that opened the door um, to this stage of my life, but I also got to work with uh, John Doyle who kind of, in his approach to theater, in his approach to making theater and working with actors, took me back to why an actor acts. It's a very curious way. It's a very, uh, a lot of people call it minimalist, but it's, uh, but John calls it essentialist. It's an essentialist approach to acting where you strip away everything and you use only those things that are really essential in making your art. And um, I think it's something that actors often forget to do because we layer on so many things as we, as we move forward, um, working on a particular project or working on a body of work. Um, and it was strange because in many respects it felt like I had never acted before. Every day I was discovering something new, not just about Pacific Overtures, not just about the material that I was working on, but about myself, um, about the actor, and not just about the actor, but about the person, about the impulse to create, the impulse to act. It was, um, it was a remarkable way to close the circle. I also got to do um, a song in the show that Sondheim has um, said on record is his favorite song, Someone in a Tree. Um, I was surprised that I was chosen to sing that song. I thought it would be uh, assigned to a colleague of mine, someone who I've known for many, many years. Um, but when they pass out the music, um, I realized that I was being gifted something and that uh, I had a responsibility not just to the show, not just to Mr. Sondheim, not just to John Doyle, uh, but to the, to the youngest, sweetest part of myself that wanted to be an actor when he was a kid. And oddly enough, the song is a little about that. Um, I don't know if I ever got it right, but it doesn't matter because I got to work on it. I think that's the point of what we do. It isn't so much that we try to get it right. The point is that we try. I'm an Asian American actor. Um, that has been um, that has been a benefit, and it's been to my detriment as well in the course of my career, which has spanned, I think, now four decades. Um, it has not been easy, uh, even in the best of times. Um, there's an enormous amount of, of um, I'd say, inner conflict in dealing with it. First and foremost, I consider myself an actor. But it would be difficult to consider myself an actor who wasn't Asian American because I am Asian American. Diversity uh, is, is a, the, the whole question of diversity is a very stormy sea to navigate uh, for an actor of color. Um, I think particularly for Asian American actors who are 
considered fairly invisible. Yet I've managed to do it for, you know, just about four decades. I don't know how. I honestly don't know how I've done it, other than the fact that I've continued to show up. I have uh, taken the admonition uh, that has been thrown out to every single actor of whatever color. Um, show up, be prepared. Don't take disappointment personally and persevere. And yet to say, if that was all I did, would be to be grossly unfair to the struggles that actors of color wage every day. Um, someone said long ago that Ginger Rogers had to be a better dancer than Fred Astaire because she had to do everything that he did, except she had to do it backwards and in heels. Actors of color have to do everything that actors who are not of color get to do. Except we don't get to do it as often. And we have to do it in our skin. It's, um, it's a sad commentary on a reality that has existed far too long. I think one of the things that we have all had to contend with is that we are constantly waiting for the industry to make allowances for us, which is another way of saying that we are still asking for permission to work. And I think that that's the biggest problem for us, is that we're constantly asking for permission to work. And it's the thing we can't do. If no one's giving us permission to work, we have to create our own work. But one of the drawbacks of that is that there's a single industry and it's dominated by a single consciousness. So in a weird way, we have to create an alternate industry for ourselves and hope that that will get attention. Um, that's another sad commentary. Why does there just have to be one industry? I say this over and over and over again to young Asian American actors, people who are just starting out, that oftentimes um, the other side, the powers that be, see our cries, our pleas for more diversity in casting as a plea for entitlement. That is not the case at all. Nobody's asking for an entitlement. All we're asking for is a level playing ground, right? A place where we have the opportunity to prove that we are the best person in the room, just like anyone else can be the best person in the room, because you know what? We are prepared. The training is there, the talent is there, the passion is there, the craft is there. Give us a chance to show it, that's all. And if we can not get a job because, hey, we're not the best person in the room, so be it. But, those opportunities just haven't been there. A lot of times you'll find that people of color, actors of color, have worked so much harder and are so much more well prepared because like Ginger Rogers and Fred Astaire, like Ginger Rogers had to do everything backwards and in heels, we have to do everything that actors of, who are not of color uh, get to do, except we have to do it in our skins. Sometimes that can be an advantage. I've been extraordinarily blessed um, in my career. Um, I, I've gotten to play roles that are not specifically roles for people of color. In fact, they're traditionally roles played by uh, Caucasians. 
I would like to think that that happened because I was the best person in the room. I know that I felt prepared enough to play those roles. I know that every role I played, I learned a little more, I got a little better. Um, I confronted what was, and I continue to do this, um, what was probably the weakest part of my craft in the hopes of overcoming it. Um, I'm thinking, as, as I move on to uh, another decade in my long career, that uh, maybe I'm learning a little bit. Maybe I'm learning a little bit something about acting. Uh, and uh, I'm very grateful that people have noticed. One thing I've noticed is that the industry is taking notice. Um, that uh, diversity is becoming uh, more of a practice. I'm not going to say it's routine, but there's a younger generation of directors. And I think, I think you'll see a lot of them working off-Broadway, and I think many of them have worked here at primary stages, um, who self-consciously have broken the color barrier. Um, for instance, in the play that I did, uh, Discord, uh, one of my favorite directors, Kimberly Sr., um, had to cast Thomas Jefferson, Leo Tolstoy, and uh, Charles Dickens. Thomas Jefferson, of course, was a tall, handsome, white man, brilliant actor, Michael Ben Lawrence. Uh, Charles Dickens was a fabulous, fabulous African-American actor named Duane Boutte, and yours truly played Leo Tolstoy. That was the, uh, that was the rainbow of literary history, you might say. Um, and nobody raised an eyebrow. It worked. It worked because, not just because she had a vision, Kimberly, not just because she had a vision of the play, um, and not just because she had a vision of the theater, but she had a vision of the world, of what the world could be and should be. And when you think about it, isn't that what theater is all about. Okay, so yes, I was trained as an historian, and one of the questions that comes up a lot from people who find this out was, uh, do I have a favorite period in history? Um, I have many favorite periods in history. Most of them have been uh, magnified in my tiny little brain uh, by movies, uh, great Hollywood films, um, that, uh, um, that sort of romanticize um, historical events or trends or eras. Um, and it, it, it's, it, there's a combination of disappointment and great fulfillment uh, in going back and studying those periods of time. Um, say, ancient Rome, uh, you know, there were movies like um, uh, Quo Vadis, or um, Spartacus, uh, which really pop out uh, to me, particularly Spartacus, great screenplay by Dalton Trumbo. Um, uh, right now I've been reading a lot about, the, uh, about Spain in the 20th century, um, probably because my wife and I recently walked the Camino de Santiago in Spain, the 500 mile pilgrimage across the north of Spain. Um, and you just want to uh, immerse yourself in the history of that land and those peoples in the same way that a walk like that will immerse yourself in the landscape. Um, you just get lost in it. Um, I think one of the great things about, um, about studying history is uh, finding parallels for what happened, uh, not just in Spain or ancient Rome or uh, Japan, uh, you know, uh, it, you know, where I'm from, um, or any other place, uh, how you find parallels uh, in our own lives. Um, you find the same mistakes being made. You find uh, that great discoveries are really nothing new. They're just mirrors of other discoveries that have happened before. Um, but one thing you learn time and time again 
is that thing that Martin Luther King said that, uh, that our dear beloved President Obama quoted time and time again, the arc of history is long, but it ends in justice. It really is true. I may have, I may have misquoted that just a bit, but the sentiment is very, very true. If there's one thing uh, that history has taught me, and returning to study history and read history or watch history time and time again, is um, that as hard as things are right now, as many sacrifices we have to make, they will be worth it in the end. If not for us, certainly for our children. I think every creative impulse is in response to something that happens to a community. Artists are, yes, individuals. Artists are, yes, different from, I don't want to say everyone else, but for lack of a better word, everyone else. But artists are a part of community. I think in many respects, Artists reveal the heartbeat of a community. The deepest inexpressible longings, regrets, feelings, the spiritual reach of every community. Um, whether that community is evolved and liberated or oppressed or oppressive, its mirror is found in the expression of its artists, whether they are theatrical artists, sculptors, writers, composers, um, outsider artists. We don't exist on our own. We can't exist on our own. There is value in the isolate. There is value in the monkish, you know, the, the monkish uh, hermit artist, sure. But I think the artists that we learn from most have a vital interactive relationship with the community. Whether they're trying to build it up or tear it down. A community is not a static thing, you know. It's a, um, it's a living, breathing, evolving entity. It's a being that is born, grows, matures, and yeah, dies, but in its death evolves into something else. And I think we as artists have the awesome responsibility, the awesome burden, of manifesting that in our work. It's scary. I think that sometimes we don't really want to do it, but we're compelled to do it because it's a gift we've been given. You know, right now we're living through this crazy time, this, this period in history where there's going to be a seismic shift in our cultural consciousness. Um, in, my, uh, in the class I was teaching today, um, we had a little round table um, and we talked about what was going on outside the walls of the studio um, with the coronavirus and how things are changing so fast that we don't know what's happening next. And all of us, myself included, talked about how scared we are. Um, a few of us had some emotional moments and we broke down. 
And um, I found myself reminding my students, and I think I was reminding myself at the same time, that what we've chosen to do, um, this vocation, I think that chose us as much as we chose it to become an actor, required so much more courage than we realized. Here we are, against the advice of our peers, probably our teachers, <laughs> certainly our families, to do something where the chances of success are, are marginal at very, very best. We've chosen to go out there and do something to reveal our passions, our spirits, our hearts, our weaknesses, to complete strangers who have no idea what it costs us. What kind of courage does that take? I think the great failing of artists is they never give themselves credit for how courageous they actually are. Maybe they're not aware of it. But maybe this is the time in history, history, to own that courage, to own that awareness. You know, I hear a lot of things about, oh, when you're an actor, what do you know about politics? What do you know about culture? What do you know about society? Oh, we know so much. Maybe it's time for us to own up to that. You know, just like community is a, a living, breathing thing, I think theater is a living, breathing thing as well. Um, I, I think the human impulse is to is not to isolate; it's to gather around a piece, a, a, a group of like-minded people, uh, or to create a group of like-minded people. And I think, uh, in many respects. Theater is the same thing. It is there. There is this impulse to create constantly, to tell stories, to tell stories of the thing that threaten us, the, the, the things that threaten us most. The, to tell stories about how we overcome those things, to tell stories how we come together, or sometimes stories about how we're not able to come together despite our best efforts. Um, I, I, I think the thing I love about theater is that. You know, we're wired to do it. We're wired to make it. Um, and there will be some people who will try to stop us. There will be movements, there will be regimes, there will be catastrophes, there will be plagues that will inhibit the growth of theater, the continuance of theater. But we're wired for it, you know. We want to tell stories. At its most basic level, we'll tell the stories about how you can't stop creation of stories, of telling stories. It's sort of like that arc of history, you know. It's long, but it ends with a story. Uh, my social distancing playlist is, is catching up on a lot of screeners uh, that uh, I wasn't able to watch during the award season because I was in rehearsal for a show that abruptly closed because of the coronavirus. Um, so I'll be watching Parasite and 1917 and Jojo Rabbit. Um, I will also be watching the remastered digital Blu-ray of... Um, War and Peace, the 1967 Russian version, which I think is something like eight and a half hours long, um, which I cannot wait to watch. Um, oh my gosh, I have a stack of movies to watch. Um, uh, but I'm also um, doing a lot of reading while I'm social distancing. Uh, I am in the middle of Thomas Mann's uh, epic um, novel, Joseph and His Brothers, um, which is actually like five books in one. Um, and it's, uh, it's such a beautiful piece of work. Uh, the translation is by uh, John Woods, <clears throat> and it is a thing of beauty.
It's so gorgeous, it is to weep to read it. So, it's your turn. Now I'm taking some questions from the audience. Fire away and fall back. Um, first question is um, from a, a beginner, beginning actor. Uh, how do I stay on top of my audition game? Um, how do I prepare? How do I keep prepared? You sort of answered the question. You just keep prepared. You learn new material. You familiarize yourself with the canon. This is something that a lot of young actors don't do. It's very cool to know what the latest hit play is, or the latest hit plays are, but usually that extends back one, two, three seasons. If you don't know the canon of great American plays and you're a young American actor, learn it. Learn it. If you're doing musical theater and you don't know the canon of great musical theater pieces, Rodgers and Hammerstein, Lerner and Lowe, um, you know, Frank Lesser, learn those, learn those. Uh, learn them in the same way that a classical actor will have 15 Shakespearean monologues in their back pocket. You'll be ready. Also, um, work with friends, work with community, if you will. Have a circle of friends where you read plays, where you do monologues for each other. Never stop training. Make sure you have a coach that you visit at least once a month. Work on working on song material, working on monologue material, or um, a cold reading class, cold reading form. Okay, the question is, Sweeney Todd was my favorite musical. What was it like preparing for that role? Um, that is a that is a loaded question that uh, requires a huge answer, but I'll cut it very very short. It, it, it's just the material is so good you don't have to do much. You learn it as best you can. You get it under your belt in terms of memorization. You show up. You tell the story. You rely on your director to lead the way. You rely on your other actors to lead the way. You develop a very, very strong relationship with whoever is playing Mrs. Lovett. Um, but I'll tell you a little secret that I learned um, this time. Um, find out who Benjamin Barker is. Then you'll be able to play Sweeney Todd. Fun question, what is my favorite song to sing? I have a list, okay? Um, one of my favorite songs to sing was actually written for me for a show called Superhero that ran last year uh, off-Broadway uh, by Tom Kitt. Um, it's a song called It's Okay. It was cut during previews. As far as I know, I'm the only person that has that music. And uh, I love to sing it. It is an absolutely gorgeous song. And uh, I will say, um, it was cut from the show after one week of previews. It didn't work in the show, and I totally agreed with them uh, on cutting the song. It, it needed to go. It sort of threw the, uh, threw the second act out of, uh, the second half out of balance. And um, it was hard, but it was the right thing to do. So, um, I just want to throw that out, that if you're doing a show and the creative team feels that they have to cut some stuff that you're doing, chances are it has nothing to do with what you're doing, but the fact that it just isn't serving the show. So never take it personally. Song number two, Lyle Lovitz, If I Had a Boat. That's all I'm saying. Um, the list of songs is, is much too long to go further into, but I'll leave it with those two. Um, do I have a favorite play and a favorite musical? Um, and this is not, not something that I did, but just uh, a favorite play or favorite musical in general. Um, my favorite musical is uh, very possibly Pacific Overtures because it means to me personally. Um, uh, and uh, there are a num number of other Sondheim musicals that they're, they're sort of on the, um, on the roulette wheel of, uh, of favorite shows. It just depends on the day that the, that the ball hits their slot. 
but there is a flawed, failed musical from 1987, I think it was, that I love, um, called Rags by Charles Strauss uh, and Stephen Schwartz and Joseph Stein, which was kind of life-changing for me when I saw it. I actually saw it three times in previews. Um, it's an extraordinary score. If you've never heard the score, I suggest you find it and listen to it. Um, and it's a very, very noble attempt at, um, at uh, depicting the immigrant exper experience. Um, it, it's, it's incredible. Uh, and, I, and I can't think about that show without uh, being terribly, terribly moved. As far as plays go, um, I'm a big fan of um, early modern American plays. In other words, I, I believe that uh, the American theater found its voice um, in the 1920s and 30s, just about the same time American actors were starting to develop their own technique. Uh, playwrights like uh, Robert E. Sherwood and Sidney Kingsley and um, Elmer Rice were writing extraordinary plays. Um, Clifford Little Debts. Um, the, the plays like Detective Story, Street Scene, um, The Adding Machine. Um, plays that eventually led to writers like Tennessee Williams and Arthur Miller. Uh, those are quintessentially American plays, and I think that they're as great as uh, they're as great as Shakespeare's. Um, I really wish more people would do them more often. They're prohibitively expensive because a lot of them have casts of thousands, but uh, they depicted a singular American experience, and um, I think we should own those and um, really, really be proud of them. And um, if you're a young actor right now, um, working on material, working on scene study material, pick that stuff. Pick that stuff. Oh my gosh, what's my favorite thing about being a teacher? Um, I don't know. I, I, um, I love it, and yet I'm not sure I'm very good at it. I feel like I'm learning more from my students than they're learning from me. But maybe that's what a teacher is supposed to do. Um, you know, in a, in a weird way, I feel like uh, there's an evangelical part of my mission here that I have been so extraordinarily blessed for almost four decades. Um, and I get to pass on um, an inkling of what I've learned to uh, a younger generation of actors. A younger generation of actors who, I have to say, remind me of how much I wanted to be an actor. I think that's the greatest thing about being in this position. Um, I, am, I am completely staggered by their trust and their courage, by their willingness to let everything go when they walk in. I, I don't know if I was that unguarded when I was a young actor. Um, but sometimes I look at them and I say, that's what I wanted to be. And you know what, that unguarded, um, that openness um, is something that, I think it's vital for older actors, experienced actors, to be reminded of constantly. Because any play you do, and it can be the, the 900th play that you get paid to do, from that first day of rehearsal, you have to be unguarded and open. And a lot of us forget that. I know that I've forgotten it. Um, it's, uh, it's very, very refreshing walking into a, an empty studio um, with a bunch of students is, is like a breath of fresh air. It just, for me, it's like starting over. That's what I love about it. Do I have a dream role? Okay, um, this is gonna sound like a pat answer. Uh, 
I have two answers to that, actually. Number one, I would say I had a list of dream roles, but for some insane reason, I've had the opportunity to play most of my dream roles in my career. I don't know how that happened, um, but I'm, you know, I got to sing someone in a tree for Sondheim. I got to play Sweeney Todd in New York, um, et cetera, et cetera. Um, it, it, it's the strangest thing. But my pet answer to that has always been my dream role has always been the one I'm doing. Uh, I know that sounds a little odd, but it was the easiest way for me to stay immersed in the, in the role that I was playing. It didn't matter how small it was or how large it was. It was important for me to treat it that way because any role you do merits that kind of passion, that kind of ambition, that kind of coverage, if you will. Um, it's the only way you can um, fulfill it. Uh, so that's my that that's those are my answers. The role that uh, the one role that I always wanted to play that I haven't played and I'm not sure I ever will because it has taken me a long time to realize that physically I might not be right for it is Kent in Lear. I've always wanted to play Kent in Lear. So if anyone out there is listening who might be casting that, um, yeah, give me a ring. You know, a lot of questions like this come up about uh, when you're doing a revival, um, how, to honor, um, how to honor the play, um, how to honor the past, um, it, it's really, um, this is going to be a crazy answer, uh, and I'm not being glib. The answer is, it's none of your business. Your job is to show up and do the play as if it's never been done before. And remember, you're not doing it on your own. All of this is, you know, there's a global answer to how you do a revival. Uh, but that is an answer. It's funny, I said something, I said something rather brilliant in class the other day, and, uh, and I'm going to repeat it to you now because it was something that I never realized until I said it, and that is that um, choices are not made. Choices are found. How you honor a play, whether it's new or old, is not something you set out to do. It is something that happens. It is something that is found. Um, it is found in a collaborative way. It is found by community, if you will. Um, you know, we don't work alone. Um, there's a, um, a video of a film that Shelley Winters was in. It was directed by George Stevens. And she passed this on, something she learned from George Stevens. It was about acting. She said, great acting is not something that you do. And it's not something that the other guy does. Great acting is what happens in the air in between you. And I would say that applies to this question. How you honor something. You can set out on the way to rehearsal in the morning or on the way to performance at night and say, I'm going to honor the play tonight, but you can't do it by yourself. It's, that's just something that happens in the air between the actors, between the actors and the design and the production, between the production and the audience. That's how it happens. So last week, um, I opened and closed an off-Broadway show um, that was very, very well received. Uh, it was called Unknown Soldier by um, Michael Friedman and Danny Goldstein and directed by Tripp Coleman. Um, it opened on a Monday night. We had Tuesday off. On Wednesday, we went to work. We did our first performance to a very appreciative audience. Uh, apparently, our 
reviews. I don't read reviews, but apparently uh, the notices were very, very good. And uh, it was a very special, special night. On Thursday, we got an email from the theater saying due to the coronavirus, um, Wednesday night was our final performance. That the show, like many other off-Broadway shows, um, was the victim of a bloodbath of closings because um, people just couldn't go to the theater. They couldn't go out in a crowd of people. It was heartbreaking, but not unexpected. Something greater than the theater had happened. And that doesn't happen very often because the theater, as you know, um, elevates us into a world of imagination. And yet here our imagination was being squelched by the unknown, by fear, uh, and by responsibility. It was, it was heartbreaking. The journey to put up that play was heartbreaking in and of itself because uh, Michael Friedman, young genius of a composer, died unexpectedly uh, from complications to AIDS uh, in the fall of 2017, just after Unknown Soldier had its, uh, its first uh, iteration at the Windham Sound Theatre Festival. It was, um, it was heartbreaking because Unknown Soldier in and of itself is about loss and sorrow and grief and how we move on by creating a mythology of ourselves that we can believe in. Um, Creating this iteration of Unknown Soldier was a delicate process because Danny and Tripp and Michael um, were all very, very close friends going back to the 1990s. They were very protective of that legacy. And, you know, uh, we asked a question earlier uh, about how, we, how do we honor something. Um, and we wanted to honor Michael's legacy. Yet at the same time, we had to approach each day um, in a fresh way. Um, we had to sort of, um, what would be the word, disacknowledge, unacknowledge uh, Michael's absence in order to move forward on a daily basis. Um, it was tenuous, it was fraught. Uh, it was constantly frustrating, um, but in the end, we created a play that was the, it was, and it was a very, very unusual, unusual kind of play. I, I hope that someday you'll get the chance to see it somewhere. Um, um, there, there, and I say that because there was so much ambiguity built into the play. Ambiguity is oftentimes uh, considered a weak point in a narrative, and creators often do whatever they can to eliminate any ambiguity. If anything, we enriched it. We made it the strong point of the play. Uh, that's, what made, that's one of the things I think that set it apart. Um, and the play that we opened was the play that we wanted to do, not the play that anyone really expected. And audiences and critics responded to it. And so this play about sorrow and loss and grief experienced its own sorrow and loss and grief on that Wednesday night, or actually that Thursday afternoon. It was funny because um, most of us in production and in the cast 
gravitated to Playwrights Horizons later on that afternoon to collect our things. Nobody told us to do it. Nobody told us to uh, go get your stuff. Nobody set a deadline. We all just went. We all just wanted to be there. That goes back to the question of community, you know? Something greater than ourselves pulled us there. I guess that was the payoff, you know, for something that was lost. We were reminded that we created something that never existed. And now it has its own mythology and we're all a part of it. It kind of takes the sting out of the heartbreak. Um, and it reminds us that in spite of it all, in spite of, of all the unexpected darkness that awaits us out there in the coming months, um, we have the capacity to create great, great things of the spirit. And uh, it's our job to pass that along in any way we can. Thanks very much for joining us at this Primary Stages Masterclass. Keep your eye out for the next one.